I'm in the criminal justice. This is crime. It starts in the community. Our people that we get in the criminal justice system starts in the community. I'm going to start with laws because we have areas of prevention there, or they start there. We move up through the juvenile system. We'll next have Walter after Lois, and then we'll have Martin march and talk about the adult system. Before we do that, I want to just lay a little bit of foundation. I wasn't supposed to move. I want you to keep in mind as each of these talk, uh, each panel is presents. And I'm just going to talk, just really give you some brief uh, statistics for adults. Uh, I, for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, this is a framework I like to just make sure you're aware of. There is a budget of five point. They have a budget of five point seven million dollars. Excuse me, billion as in B. The average cost per inmate is thirty one thousand thirty thousand nine hundred twenty nine dollars per inmate. And if I'm wrong, if you, if you need to correct me, that's fine. I got okay. Um, 5.7 billion is the annual budget. They have 3,000, it's 3,364 dollars is the average cost for every person on parole. The, uh, I'm going to move over. There are 49,100 employees of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. 42,453 staff work in institutions. 3,000 or 3,114 in parole and 3,500 in administrative services. We're talking about, I want you to know the magnitude of this organization. When we start to talk about crime and the amount of money that we spend to either try to prevent it, call it, contain it, or whatever it happens to be. What does the average offender look, look like? There are 300,000 offenders in the system in the state of California. 29% are white, 29% are black, and 37% are Hispanic, so the stats that I have. 93 are males. If you have 300,000 inmates, still 7% are females. That's still significant when you're talking about mothers and children and grandmothers and where our babies are getting their children and our children are getting their foundations. Average age, it says 36. So I was surprised today when I looked at some of the stats. Because I thought I see a lot younger guys. Most of the guys that I see coming through the pro revocation process are in their early 20s, 22, 21, 27. I'm just shocked. But this is the average, but the average out of 300,000 is 36. The average time served is under five years. It's 52.9 months. The average reading level is seventh grade, and that's really pretty high, because this is average. Many lower, some higher. The stats that I also read, and I'm sorry, I, I wanted to go and confirm this before, and I didn't get a chance, but the stats I saw that there are 27,252 prisoners serving life without the possibility of parole. That's the document I saw. Now that means you're housing this amount of people for the rest of their lives at a minimum of $30,000 a year. You know, I have a difficult time talking to strangers, so let me ask the question. How many of you are from Southern California, right? Right. Here. Live, you live, you're, you're here, okay. And how many of you are from Northern California? Great. Um, I think that I can be very truthful when I say to you that we all share the same problem. And the problem is that we are trying to protect our communities and to make sure that they remain safe. Unlike my colleagues that are sitting to the right, I am the college dropout. I am the exception to the rule. I came along at a time when you could make it if you didn't have that college degree. Uh, I was extremely fortunate. I came along when businesses would train you and give you a stable environment to work in, and you could plan on retiring from that and drawing a pension and doing all those good things. And whew, God really blessed me because I was born so long ago that that was possible. Not so today. Our youngsters and we are 
unbelievably challenged by the fact that unless we find a solution to this problem on crime, the quality of life that, you, that, that I know and I enjoy, that my colleagues know and, and enjoy, and that you probably are involved in today, will absolutely positively go away. And let me tell you about what goes on in Duarte. Duarte is a very small town, 22,000 people on the rolls. I'm sure there's probably 40,000 there that are not registered the right way, but guess what? That's what the records say. Uh, we are uh, a bedroom community. We're about 12 miles east of Pasadena. Uh, it is um, a safe haven as far as crime is concerned. Um, I can tell you that last year in 2005, we experienced the, the lowest part run crime rate in 25 years. And, and for you who may already know about part one crime, um, that's homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, theft, grand theft auto, arson. We are at the lowest level in 25 years. We had some 522 cases of part one crime. And so in my community, I watch kids play in the parks and I watch seniors walk up and down the streets early in the morning and at night. But I also live very close to um, one of the wealthiest communities around Bradbury, and if you've watched the news, you've known that uh, this fellow that supposedly killed people right up there in, in the hills a few years back, my mother stopped walking on our safe streets back when that happened. At the same time this safe environment is going on, we have had in my small town since March of last year more than 75 cases of gang violence or intimidation from shootings to people being accosted or threatened. And for me, that sends a signal that part crime, part one crimes may be down, but the problem is still there. We are still faced on a daily basis with someone somewhere in my town or a neighboring city being the victim of or having a child or a relative or a friend or a neighbor be a part of a very threatening situation. Um, Gretchen asked me here because we tend to sit in our communities and expect law enforcement to fix the problem. And you're going to hear from Walt, who has just a wonderful story to tell. I was privileged to be at uh, the NAACP banquet in Pasadena when he talked about, and I hope he tells you about it, his background, his history, and his plans for what he was going to do with the California Youth Authority when the governor appointed him there, and how frustrating it became because the answer is really not there or in Mr. Uh, a prison people coming out of prison. I had the pleasure of giving a scholarship to a young man who came out of prison. He lived right down by you when you were a kid. He went, yeah, 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 that's okay. But he, yeah, Gretchen lived down in a part of the city that we call the hole. Yeah. And a lot, a lot, of, a lot of activity went on down there after that her family moved out. But this young man got, in, got off on the wrong track, went into prison. He is now 47 years old. And Carl and I had the opportunity to help him with his scholarship. He is in a finishing his junior year at UNLV, trying to come out of this hole. Trying to come out of this hole. His family will not give him one penny. They are spending $20,000 on attorney's fee to try to get a cousin who's in prison for life for murdering a man that he really did murder. They're trying to get that sentence changed, reduced, trying to get him out. But they won't give this young man a penny to go to college. So I say to you, challenge yourself. I, 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 I think of that story often. I say to you again, say this, write it down. I hope you make a note of it, that Lois Gaston asks you, if it's to be, it's up to me.
there's something very different happening with young black men, and it's sometimes something we can no longer ignore. And I want to emphasize that something we can no longer ignore. Uh, in 2000, 65 percent of black male high school dropouts in their 20s were jobless, that are unable to find work, not seeking it, are incarcerated. So this is a major theme: incarcerated. 2004, they shared grown to 72 percent compared to 34 percent of white and 19 percent of Hispanic dropouts. Incarceration rates climbed in the 90s and reached historic highs in, in the past few years. In 1995, 16 percent of black men in their 20s who did not attend college were in jail or prison. By 2004, 21 percent were incarcerated. By their mid-30s, six in ten black men who had dropped out of high school spent time in prison. One of the dilemmas that we face in the Department of Corrections right now is just housing inmates. Pure and simple as that. We're projected to run out of beds in June 2007 to where we won't have, um, won't have beds. The counties are threatening not to accept our parole violators because we can't take the transition. Um, what I want to impress upon you, and because I've been to these conferences, like uh, Gretchen has said, a number of years, and hopefully I'm bringing a different perspective from my point of view in terms of connecting the dots, and a dot that I think is very significant in the connection of dots that will help reduce crime. I want to close with one thing. There's two entities that control what I do. One is the courts. The other is the legislature. Mm -hmm. That's what controls what I do. We get monitored. My people who come from out of state get paid $200, $300 uh, an hour as it relates to Coleman, which is um, care and treatment from the mental health perspective, Plata, care and treatment from the medical perspective. They come and they evaluate how well I do that job. That's where I get my report card. So guess where my efforts go? If I want to keep my job, guess where my efforts go? But again, the effort of rehabilitation for the adult felon, my opinion, deserves focus in terms of connecting the dots, in terms of reducing crime in our community. Thank you.